Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. We are founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds good to you, then you are in the right place. Um, I would like to remind everybody that if you would like to make a donation to help uh, cover the cost of this room, um, Jack has a card swiper. Uh, we usually have a jar at the back of the room and you can also do it through Meetup. Uh, also, um, next week we will have board games at the Wayward Coffee House. Uh, at three o'clock, that's on 65th and Roosevelt. So averagers will have um, board games next week. Uh, we had a lot of fun at movie night, so for those of you who would like to come to movie night, we have that uh, the first Friday of every month. All right, ready? Thanks for much, Jack. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Okay, so by a show of hands, who thinks that words sometimes count as violence? Okay, so <laughs> This topic has been on the minds of a lot of people in the past few years. All the changes on college campuses, trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggression training. Are they reasonable? Are these things that we should have been that should have been there the whole time and we were just blind to them or ignorant of them? Like the importance of gay marriage? trans rights, or the existence of various kinds of privilege? Or are some leftists taking things to an unreasonable extreme, so much so that they're becoming illiberal along the way? This can be a challenging question for liberals to wrestle with because it tends to trigger the tribalism that humans have evolved with. Doesn't criticizing universities for being too leftist sound like you're chanting the opposing team's cheer? But those who are interested in the truth <coughs> must strive to evaluate ideas on their merits without concern for which teams chant which cheers. After all, it's possible that our team is chanting the wrong cheer, or even that you're not on the team that you think you are to begin with. In that spirit, I'd like to share two dueling perspectives on the matter, uh, both rooted in science. The first is from Lisa Feldman Barrett, a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University, where she focuses on the study of emotion. She's the director of the Interdisciplinary Effective Science Laboratory, a founding editor-in-chief of the journal Emotion Review, and the author of How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. She gave a TED Talk called You Aren't at the Mercy of Your Emotions, Your Brain Creates Them. The second perspective is from Jonathan Haidt and Greg uh, Lukianoff. We've had a few talks about Jonathan Haidt's work here at Seattle Atheist Church. He's a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business. His academic specialization is the psychology of morality and the moral emotions. Haidt is the author of two books, The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth and Ancient Wisdom, and The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. He gave a TED Talk called The Moral Roots of Liberals and Conservatives. Greg Lukianoff is the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, a nonprofit group whose goal is to defend and sustain individual rights in America's colleges and universities, including the rights to freedom of speech, legal equality, due process, religious liberty, and sanctity of conscience. Okay, so let's start with uh, Lisa uh, Feldman Barrett's article from July 14th, 2017, called When is Speech Violence? Imagine that a bully threatens to punch you in the face. A week later, he walks up to you and breaks your nose with his fist. Which is more harmful, the punch or the threat? The answer might seem obvious. Physical violence is physically damaging. Verbal statements aren't. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But scientifically speaking, it's not that simple. 
Words can have a powerful effect on your nervous system. Certain types of, of adversity, even those involving no physical contact, can make you sick, alter your brain, even kill neurons, and shorten your life. Your body's immune system includes little proteins called pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause inflammation when you're physically injured. Under certain conditions, however, these cytokines themselves can cause physical illness. What are those conditions? One of them is chronic stress. Your body also contains little packets of gen genetic material that sit at the end of your chromosomes. They're called telomeres. Each time your cells divide, their telomeres get a little shorter. And when they become too short, you die. This is normal aging. But guess what else shrinks your telomeres? Chronic stress. If words can cause stress, and if prolonged stress can cause physical harm, then it seems that speech, at least certain kinds of speech, can be a form of violence. But which types? This question has taken on some urgency in the past few years, as professor defenders of social justice have clashed with professor defenders of free speech on college campuses. Student advocates have protested vigorously, even violently, against invited speakers whose views they consider not just offensive, but harmful. Hence the desire to silence, not debate the speaker. Trigger warnings are based on a similar principle that discussions of certain topics will trigger or reproduce past trauma, as opposed to merely challenging or discomforting the student. The same goes for microaggressions. This idea, there's often no difference between speech and violence, has struck many as a coddling or infantilizing of students, as well as a corrosive influence on the freedom of expression necessary for intellectual progress. It's a safe bet that the Pew Survey research uh, data released on Monday, I suppose Monday before July 14th, 2017, uh, which showed that Republicans' views of colleges and universities have taken a sharp negative turn since 2015, results in part from exasperation with the speech equals violence equation. The scientific findings I described above provide empirical guidance for which kinds of controversial speech should and shouldn't be acceptable on campus and in civil society. In short, the answer depends on whether the speech is abusive or merely offensive. Offensiveness is not bad for your body and brain. Your nervous system evolved to withstand periodic bouts of stress, such as fleeing from a tiger, taking a punch, or encountering an odious idea in a university lecture. Entertaining someone else's distasteful perspective can be educational. Early in my career, I taught a course that covered the eugenics movement, which advocates the selective breeding of humans. Eugenics, in its time, became a scientific justification for racism. To help my students understand this ugly part of scientific history, I assigned them to debate its pros and cons. The students refused. No one was willing to argue, even as part of a classroom exercise, that certain races were genetically superior to others. So, I enlisted an African-American faculty member in my department to argue in favor of eugenics, while I argued against. Halfway through the debate, we switched sides. We were modeling for the students <clears throat> a fundamental principle of university education, as well as civil society. When you're forced to engage a position you strongly disagree with, you learn something about the other perspective, as well as about your own. The process feels unpleasant, but it's a good kind of stress temporary and not harmful to your body. And you reap the longer term benefits of learning. What's bad for your nervous system, in contrast, are long stretches of simmering stress. If you spend a lot of time in a harsh environment worrying about your safety, that's the kind of stress that brings on illness and remodels your brain. That's also true of a political climate in which groups of people endlessly hurl hateful words at one another and a rampant bullying in school or on social media. A culture of constant, casual brutality is toxic to the body, and we suffer for it. That's why it's reasonable, scientifically speaking, not to allow a provocateur and hate monger like Milo Yiannopoulos to speak at your school. He's part of something noxious, a campaign of abuse, 
There's nothing to be gained from debating him, for debate is not what he's offering. On the other hand, when the political scientist Charles Murray argues that genetic factors help account for racial disparities in IQ, you might find his view to be repugnant and misguided, but it's only offensive. It's offered as a scholarly hypothesis to be debated, not thrown like a grenade. There is a difference between permitting a culture of casual brutality and entertaining an opinion that you strongly oppose. The former is a danger to civil society and to our health. The latter is the lifeblood of democracy. By all means, we should have open conversations and vigorous debate <clears throat> about controversial or offensive topics. But we must also halt speech that bullies and torments. From the perspective of our brain cells, the latter is literally a form of violence. Okay, so now, by a show of hands, who thinks that words sometimes count as violence? All right, let's hear another perspective. <clears throat> Here's Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff's article from July 18th, 2017, four days after the previous one, titled, Why It's a Bad Idea to Tell Students That Words Are Violence. <laughs> Of all the ideas percolating on college campuses these days, the most dangerous one might be that speech is sometimes violence. We're not talking about verbal threats of violence, which are used to coerce and intimidate, and which are illegal and not protected by the First Amendment. We're talking about speech that is deemed by members of an identity group to be critical of the group, or speech that is otherwise upsetting to members of the group. This is the kind of speech that many students today refer to as a form of violence. If Milo Yiannopoulos speaks on the University of California Berkeley campus, is that an act of violence? Recently, the psychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett, a highly respected emotion researcher at Northeastern University, published an essay in the New York Times titled, When is Speech Violence? She offered support from neuroscience and health psychology research for students who want to use the word violence in this expansive way. The essay made two points that we think are valid and important, but it drew two inferences from those points that we think are invalid. First valid point, chronic stress can cause physical damage. Feldman Barrett cited research on the ways that chronic, not short-term, stressors can make you sick, alter your brain, even kill neurons and shorten your life. The research here is indeed clear. The first invalid inference. <clears throat> Feldman Barrett used these empirical findings to advance a syllogism. If words can cause stress, and if prolonged stress can cause physical harm, then it seems that speech, at least certain types of speech, can be a form of violence. It is logically true that if A can cause B and B can cause C, then A can cause C. But following this logic, the resulting inference would be merely that words can cause physical harm, not that words are violence. If you're not convinced, just rerun the syllogism, starting with gossiping about a rival, for example, or giving one's students a lot of homework. Both practices can cause prolonged stress to others, but that doesn't turn them into forms of violence. Feldman Barrett's second valid point lies in her argument that young people are anti-fragile. They grow from f facing and overcoming adversity. She says, quote, offensiveness is not bad for your body and brain. Your nervous system evolved to withstand periodic bouts of stress, such as fleeing from a tiger, taking a punch, or encountering an odious, odious idea in a university lecture. Entertaining someone else's distasteful perspective can be educational. When you're forced to engage a person you strongly disagree with, you learn something about their perspective, as well as your own. The process feels unpleasant, but it's a good kind of stress. Temporary, not harmful to your body. And you reap the longer-term benefits of learning." End quote. Feldman Barrett could have gone a step further. This good kind of stress isn't just not harmful, it also sometimes make an makes an individual stronger and more resilient. The next time that person faces a similar si situation, she'll experience a milder stress response because it's no longer novel and because her coping repertoire has grown. 
This was the argument at the heart of our 2015 essay in The Atlantic, The Coddling of the American Mind. We worried that colleges are making students more fragile, more easily harmed by trying to protect them from the sorts of <laughs> small and brief offensive experiences that Feldman Barrett is talking about. Feldman Barrett then contrasted <clears throat> brief experiences of offensiveness with chronic stressors. Quote, what's bad for your nervous system, in contrast, are long stretches of simmering stress. If you spend a lot of time in a harsh environment worrying about your safety, that's the kind of stress that brings, an, brings on illness and remodels your brain. That's also true of a political climate in which groups of people endlessly hurl hateful words at each other and of rampant bullying in school or on social media. A culture of constant, casual brutality is toxic to the body and we suffer for it." End quote. We agree, but what then are the implications for college campuses? In Feldman Barrett's second Invalid Inference, she writes, quote, that's why it's reasonable, scientifically speaking, not to allow a provocateur and hate monger like Milo Yiannopoulos to speak at your school. He's part of something noxious, a campaign of abuse. There is nothing to be gained from debating him, for debate is not what he is offering." End quote. But wait, wasn't Feldman Barrett's key point the contrast between short-term and long-term stressors? What would have happened had Yiannopoulos been allowed to speak at Berkeley? He would have faced a gigantic crowd of peaceful protesters inside and outside the venue. The event would have been over in two hours. Any students who thought his words would cause them trauma could have avoided the talk and left the protesting to others. Anyone who joined the protests would have left with a strong sense of campus solidarity. And most importantly, all Berkeley students would have learned how, uh, an essential <laughs> lesson for life in 2017 how to encounter a troll without losing one's cool. The goal of a troll, after all, is to make people lose their cool. Feldman Barrett's argument only makes sense if Yiannopoulos' speech is interpreted as one brief episode in a long stretch of simmering stress on campus. The argument works only if Berkeley students experience their school as a harsh environment, a culture of casual brutality in which they are chronically worrying about their safety. Maybe that is the perception of some students. But if so, is the solution to change the school or to change the perception? Aggressive and even violent protests have erupted at some of the country's most progressive schools, such as Berkeley, Middlebury College, and Evergreen State College. Are these schools brutal and toxic environments for members of various identity groups? Or has a set of new ideas on campus taught students to see oppression and violence everywhere they look? If students are repeatedly told that numerical disparities are proof of systemic dis discrimination and a clumsy or insensitive question is an act of aggression, a microaggression, and words are sometimes <laughs> acts of violence that will shorten your life, then it begins to make sense that they would worry about their safety chronically even within some of America's most welcoming and protective institutions. We are not denying that college students encounter racism and other forms of discrimination on campus from individuals or from the institutional systems. We are, rather, pointing out the fact, uh, a fact that is crucial in any discussion of stress and its effects. People do not react to the world as it is. They react to the world as they interpret it. And those interpretations are major determinants of success and failure in life. As we said in our Atlantic article, quote, rather than trying to protect students from words and ideas that they will inevitably encounter, colleges should do all they can to equip students to thrive in a world full of ideas and words that they cannot control. One of the great truths taught by Buddhism and Stoicism, Hinduism, and many other traditions is that you can never achieve happiness by making the world conform to your desires. But you can master your desires and habits of thought. This, of course, is the goal of cognitive behavioral therapy. End quote. We wrote those words in early 2015, 
We were responding to stories from across the country about new demands that students were making for protection from the kinds of offensiveness that Feldman Barrett says are not bad for your body and brain. We explained why we thought that widespread adoption of trigger warnings, safe spaces, and microaggression training would backfire. Rather than keeping students safe from harm, the culture of safety teaches students to engage in some of the same cognitive distortions that cognitive behavioral therapy tries to eliminate. Distortions such as emotional reasoning, catastrophizing, and dichotomous thinking. <clears throat> These are associated with anxiety, depression, and difficulty coping. We think our argument is much stronger today for two reasons. First, our article was published in August of 2015, a few months before a wave of campus protests began in Missouri, Yale, and dozens of other schools. Those protesters usually demanded that the universities <coughs> implement an array of policies designed to keep students safer from offense. Policies such as microaggression training supplemented by the creation of systems for reporting and punishing microaggressors. Along with the creation of more ethnic or identity-based centers. We expect these policies, whose effectiveness is not supported by empirical evidence, will in the long run lead students to feel even less safe on campus than in 2015 because they may increase the number of offenses perceived while heightening feelings of identity-based division and victimization. Some evidence also suggests that diversity training, when not carefully and sensitively implemented, can create a backlash which amplifies tensions. Second, we wrote our article at a time that saw hints of a mental health crisis on campuses, but no conclusive survey evidence. Two years later, the evidence is overwhelming. So, the social psychologist Jean Twenge has just written a book titled iGen, which is short for Internet Generation, in which she analyzes four large national data sets that track the mental health of teenagers and college students. When the book is released in August, Americans will likely be stunned by her findings. Graph after graph shows the same pattern. Lines drift mildly up or down across the decades as baby boomers are followed by Gen X, which is followed by the Millennials. But as soon as the data includes iGen, those born after roughly 1994, the rates of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and suicide spike upward. Is iGen so different from the Millennials because the former faces more chronic long-term stress? Have the country's colleges suddenly become brutal, toxic places, increasingly hostile to members of various identity groups? Some would argue, as Twenge does, that social media changed the nature of iGen's social interactions. But if social media is the biggest cause of the mental health crisis, then the solution lies in changing the nature or availability of social media for teenagers. Making the offline world safer by banning the occasional stress-inducing speaker will not help. We think the mental health crisis on campus is better understood as a crisis of resilience. <coughs> Since 2012, when members of iGen first began entering college, growing numbers of college students have become less able to cope with the challenges of campus life, including offensive ideas, insensitive professors, and rude or even racist and sexist peers. Previous generations of college students learned to live with such challenges in preparation for success in the far more offensive-filled world beyond the college gates. As Van Jones put it in response to a question by David Absarod about how progressive students should react to ideolo ideologically offensive speakers on campus, quote, I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. That's different. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. <coughs> I'm not going to take all the weights out of the gym. That's the whole point of the gym. This is the gym." End quote. This is why the idea that speech is violence is so dangerous. It tells the members of a generation already beset by anxiety and depression that the world is a far more violent and threatening place than it really is. It tells them that words 
ideas and speakers can literally kill them. Even worse, at a time of rapidly rising political polarization in America, it helps a small subset of that generation justify political violence. A few days after the riot that shut down Yiannopoulos' talk at Berkeley, in which many people were punched, beaten, and pepper sprayed by masked protesters, the main campus newspaper ran five op-ed essays by students and recent, alum recent alumni under the series title, Violence as Self-Defense. One excerpt, asking people to maintain peaceful dialogue with those who do legitimately do not think their lives matter is a violent act. The implication of this expansive use of the word violence is that we are justified in punching and pepper spraying them, even if all they did was say words. We're just defending ourselves against their violence. But if this way of thinking leads to actual violence, and if that violence triggers counter-violence from the other side, as happened a few weeks later at Berkeley, then where does it end? In the country's polarized democracy, telling young people that words are violence may in fact lead to a rise in real, physical violence. Free speech, properly understood, is not violence. It is the cure for violence. In his 1993 book, Kindly Inquisitors, the author Jonathan Rauch explains that freedom of speech is part of a system he calls liberal science, an intellectual system that arose with the Enlightenment and made the movement so successful. The rules of liberal science include, no argument is ever truly over. Anyone can participate in the debate, and no one gets to claim <laughs> special authority to end the question once and for all. Central to this idea is the role of evidence, debate, discussion, and persuasion. Rauch contrasts liberal science with the system that dominated before it, the fundamentalist system, in which kings, priests, oligarchs, and others with power decide what is true and then get to enforce orthodoxy using violence. Liberal science led to the radical social invention of a strong distinction between words and actions. And though some on campus question that distinction today, it has been one of the most valuable inventions in the service of peace, progress, and innovation that human civilization ever came up with. Freedom of speech is the eternally radical idea that individuals will try to settle their differences through debate and discussion, through evidence and attempts at persuasion, rather than through the coercive power of administrative authorities or violence. To be clear, when we refer to free speech, we're not talking about things like threats, intimidation, or incitement. The First Amendment provides categorical exemptions uh, for those because such words are linked to actual physical violence. The First Amendment also excludes harassment when words are used in a directed pattern of discriminatory behavior. But the extraordinary body of legal reasoning that has developed around the First Amendment also recognizes that universities are different from other settings. In, 2010, uh, in a 2010 decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, Rodriguez uh, versus Maricopa County Community College District, Chief Judge Alex Kaczynski noted, the urge to censor is greatest where debate is most disquieting and orthodoxy most entrenched. He then explained the special nature of universities using terms that illustrate Rauch's liberal science. Quote, the right to provoke, offend, and shock lies at the core of the First Amendment. This is particularly so on college campuses. Intellectual advancement has traditionally progressed through discord and dissent, as a diversity of views ensures that ideas survive because they are correct and not because they are popular. Colleges and universities, sheltered from the currents of popular opinion by tradition, geography, tenure, and monetary endowments, have historically fostered that exchange. But that role in our society will not survive if certain points of view may be declared beyond the pale." End quote. In sum, it was a radical enlightenment, enlightenment idea to tolerate the existence of dissenters an even more radical idea to actually engage with them. 
Universities are or should be the preeminent centers of liberal science. They have a duty to foster an intellectual climate that separates true ideas from popular religious <laughs> ones. The conflation of words with violence is not a new or progressive idea invented on college campuses in the last two years. It is an ancient and regressive idea. Americans should all be troubled that it is becoming popular again, especially on college campuses where it least belongs. Okay, so now, by a show of hands, who thinks that words sometimes count as violence? Interesting. Let's discuss.